From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 159, recorded on September 27th, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hey there, Vincent. And remotely, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Hey there, Vincent. It's gorgeous <laughs> out. I mean, hey there, Daniel. It's Daniel. It's gorgeous <laughs> out. It's Well, it was. It's starting to cloud up, actually, <laughs> if you look. It's been a nice day. Uh, I have to say, this morning in it uh, was Belgium, pleasant. it was very nice. You were in Belgium this morning. I yes, left you Belgium were. on a 10 a.m. flight. Oh, yeah. And uh, I would told Dixon earlier, there are few people who would get in the airport and then come here to do a podcast. The they would probably put it another time. Right. <laughs> but this was the window of opportunity. That's right. And I'm so devoted. You are to these that you are. Um, I came here, and I am. We want to find out what happened to this guy. I, I'm gonna. What do you? What's the word? Soldier through it. There you go. Soldier on, soldier on. All right, Daniel, remind us, we have a case from the previous episode. Yes, uh, to remind everyone who listened last time and uh, to introduce this gentleman to those clicking in for the first time, tuning in for the first time. We presented the case of a male in his 50s who had been referred to me by one of my colleagues, by another infectious disease physician. And this gentleman had been concerned for several years that he was infested with parasites. Uh, this gentleman is a retired firefighter. He's a survivor of the 9-11 tragedy. He had several years of skin issues, uh, and these are not resolving. We get a little background. He tells us back in 2009 he was dating a Haitian girl, and uh, he actually ended up going to Haiti to assist with disaster release relief efforts. And there he noticed that this itchy rash um, developed. It was worse at night, and he tells us that previous physicians had noted elevated eosinophils. I'll mention that we, we confirm that. Uh, he'd had a prior biopsy. He tells us that this prior biopsy um, had shown an arthropod with compound eyes, and he, he's not able to find that um, actual report. He reports he's been treated with oral ivermectin, topical permethrin, and he says that despite this, these ulcers form all over his skin. Uh, they are preceded by small white objects that pop off the skin, and uh, he catches these, and then he has videos of them swimming in a circular pattern in water. He um, has had repeated cystoscopies because of a complaint of hematuria. He's had um, multiple biopsies, skin scrapings. Um, the only one is, he tells us, the compound eyes, otherwise unrevealing, and the ones that are available uh, just describe inflammatory changes in the skin. He uh, describes a rather disturbing episode with fork, forked-headed worms uh, that were coming out and that these were in the toilet. Uh, he also had an episode where he was temporarily blind. Uh, this resolved after a number of hours. Um, he had seen another physician who was upset because this physician suggested that maybe a lot of these symptoms were dr drug related. And he, he does report that there is some drug use and uh, he's unable to actually get off the, the illicit substances long enough to get a clean tox screen. Um, he brought me a video of the, the swimming the swimming things. Actually, uh, just to describe it a little bit more, it's a, it's a video. It starts with him in the car and then this this thing pops off and then he gets it and then he puts it in water and then we've got a video of it swimming around the water. So we've got the whole thing sort of annotated. Um, he has the family, he has the, the issue of substance abuse. His family history is unremarkable. And when I examine him, he does have a significant ulcerated areas that are widely distributed. Um, I confirm with a, with a CBC, complete blood count, that he does have elevated eosinophils um, at 700, normals up to 500. So it is, it is above the normal range. He gets an X-ray, um, which shows calcification at the bladder periphery. There's a few areas of calcification. Um, he's had many negative tests. I mentioned um, we review um, the biopsies. He had uh, lots of stool O&Ps. Everything's been unremarkable. And I think that's where I left everybody. 
How long has he spent in Egypt again? Um, actually, that's interesting. I, I don't see that in our recap here. But he actually had spent time in Egypt as well. Mm. Um, and he did swim in fresh water. Yeah, actually, I see that there. Spent time in Egypt. But it doesn't uh, say several, how much. Several, right. several months. Several months. Okay, so um, interesting. And no one did a urine for ONP? Oh, you're starting to ask questions. I didn't <laughs> you betcha. That. I didn't tell you that. <laughs> I, okay, well, sorry, I didn't since do that last time, actually. <laughs> since, that's it. Were you here last time? <laughs> I don't think so. No, you're, you're allowed to ask. Yeah. Several I don't remember, ur- okay? I don't remember. <laughs> several urine um, oven parasites were sent. They were all negative. All right. He also had um, a schistosoma serologies. Um, these were done. These were also uh, negative. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right, we have some case guesses. Adil writes, Dear doctors, firstly, thank you for your twip, smart banter, and utterly engaging podcast. After multiple weeks of being right and yet reticent to take my shot, I will hazard a guess. Initially, I thought scabies because the itching was noted to be worse at night. The punctuation and explicit reference to unused bedding made me think of body lice, however. The regions impacted seem to align with this as well. Unlike with last episode's diagnosis of Babesia, I am not at all confident, but there it is. Hope all is well with you and that I can send forth future response with a bit conviction in my diagnosis. Right, wait a minute. What was the diagnosis that they submitted? <laughs> scabies. 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 Okay, not lice. Scabies. Okay, fine. I don't know. You said initially scabies and then body lice. So right. He doesn't have conviction. He or she doesn't have conviction. They're unconvicted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Dixon. Oh, I get to read this one. Good. Caitlin writes, Dear Twip Triptych. And he, uh, when you see the picture, you'll know why that was said. First of all, I want to thank you for your awesome podcasts. I've been on a Twix bender since April of 2017, averaging about 1.3 podcasts per day. And just today, I cracked 100 left to go on Twiv. <clears throat> That's great. Being fully caught up is in sight. Your podcasts have helped me get through finding my first job after graduating many hours in the lab, a commute from hell the stress of wedding planning, and a whole host of difficult personal situations. You gentlemen, and on the other podcasts, ladies, are truly amazing. I have attached a photo of a TWIP triptych for your entertainment, and it is an old, it's like a European triptych that you would see for St. George and the Dragon, basically, and uh, in the middle, of (laughs) course, we won't say who that is, but but you're hearing his voice as we speak. And then on the left and right, we have both uh, Vincent and Daniel. And it's charming. It's actually very charming. And we might want to post that on the show notes in a separate region, I think. I think this is great, by the way. And I'm listed. I don't know who the person in the middle is supposed to be. The Pope, perhaps, or some higher, maybe a cardinal because it's red, right? The, the robe that I'm wearing. Yeah, it could be red. a saint. I don't know. It's just but quite you old. Guys, that's not fair because, you know. We have swords. You have wings. You don't just have swords, yeah, you have, we have wings. wings. Yeah. You can go wherever you want, and I'm stuck on Earth. I have to I have to take care of the... Well, you have angels in the background. Maybe they can pick you up and bring you... I do. Well, what follows, however, is a longer <laughs> treatise on this subject. Right. Regarding the TWIP 158 case study, <clears throat> this unfortunate patient has so many symptoms that I doubt a single parasitic infection could explain all of them. To complicate matters further, it is likely that some, but not all, of them are indeed trauma or drug-related. The following symptoms seem likely to be unrelated to parasites. One, the brief spell of blindness, onchocerciasis or uh, onchocercovolvulus, can cause blindness, but that is not temporary, and he was nowhere where he could have picked that up. This was more likely to be psychosomatic or drug-induced. The fork-headed worms in the toilet. I couldn't find any parasites that fit this description well, thank goodness, and he didn't successfully get a picture. Furthermore, it would be odd for someone with an intestinal parasitic infection to excrete worms once and only once. I find it more likely that this was an hallucination. Parentheses. Which substances does he usually abuse? That could be relevant. Also, I may be um, <clears throat> reading too much into it, but the fact that he dropped the phone in the toilet while trying to make a picture may indicate that he was not sober at the time. Close prints. Alternatively, it was something already present in the toilet, Prince, I recall a story about a patient who mistook mayfly larvae in the toilet for some kind of excreted worm. Really, that's interesting. 
The other symptoms, namely the calcifications in the bladder, the crusted and ulcerated skin, and the white objects are more compelling. The calcifications in the bladder are probably caused by schistosome hematobium, which the man could have acquired during his trip to Egypt some time ago. Calcifications would not appear until after a while of infection, and therefore the timing makes sense. The only issue here is that there is no mention of blood in the urine, but I don't think that appears in every patient or at every stage of infection. This infection might be missed in the stool OMP, but could be picked up with an antibody test. The treatment should be prosequantal in the Sheila still reference, uh, in the parasitic diseases, of course, 6th edition. The skin ulceration could be caused by scabies, which is common in Haiti. However, if this were the case, it would have been diagnosed earlier, and the skin scrapings were examined, but only inflammation was observed at that point. It could potentially be psychosomatic, but on the other hand, <clears throat> the white moving objects that came out of his skin were definitely real, since he took videos of them. Unless he somehow faked them, it would not be the first time some poor soul suffering from Eichborn's syndrome did such a thing in a desperate attempt to be taken seriously. However, it is quite likely that they were real. This would suggest a case of myiasis, i.e. infection of the skin with some kind of maggot. Potential suspects here are cochleomyia, the New World screwworm, wolf forthia, vigil, or opaca. It seems those only infect children, but perhaps they were able to get into his highly irritated skin. Cuterebra, less likely, uh, as those larvae are black, or one of the scabies, one of the, I'm sorry, or one of the species of sarcoph sarcophagia, which are known to infect wound, infest wounds, and might have been attracted to the skin ulcerations. This does not explain how the skin irritation began, but it might have started as a case of delusional parasitosis that caused the patient to scratch his own skin excessively. Ironically, this could have subsequently caused a real infestation. I understand that the best way to get rid of a maggot infestation is to remove the maggots physically. This can be done by using forceps after inducing the larvae to come out of, to the surface using petroleum jelly or oil. Topical or oil, oral ivermectin may also be used to kill or drive out the larvae. This poor patient was suffering from a great deal more than just the parasitic infections he may have had. <clears throat> I hope he got the medical and psychological help he needed. If I'm lucky enough to win the book, I would rather that parasitic diseases go to someone who needs it more. I have no professional use for it, while others do, and I'm quite happy uh, with the free PDF. Again, you guys are the best. <clears throat> I wouldn't mind the poetry book, though, <laughs> unless it's uh, also available as a PDF. So, Caitlin, um, that was a very nice response to the case, and thanks for the kudos. Daniel. Hannah writes, Dear TWIP hosts, I think the patient has ECPOM syndrome, also known as delusional parasitosis, with a concurrent parasitic infection. Red flags for ECPOM syndrome include his history of visiting doctors with skin scrapings and his biologically implausible description of arthropods with compound eyes living in his skin. Note, mites, which do live in the skin, do not have compound eyes or bursting forth from ulcers in his skin. Not heard of. But the insects that do this also do not match his description. His history of drug use may be a contributing factor here and or may be a coping mechanism to deal with with underlying mental issues that cause him to see, feel things that aren't physically there. All the things that he's putting on his skin may be causing irritation as well. That being said, the high eosinophil count suggests that he does have something, even if it, is, even if it isn't what he thinks he has. Given his bladder issues and history of swimming in freshwater in Egypt, there is a very good chance he has schistosoma hematobium. These parasites are widespread in Egypt, are acquired by swimming in fresh water, and can cause an elevated eosinophil count. Calcification of the bladder periphery and hematuria. Eggs are found primarily in the urine, so a negative stool ONP does not rule out this diagnosis. And although you mentioned that his schistosoma serology test came back negative, sensitivities of different tests vary widely. We get a link there. Mm -hmm. His description of Forked worms could describe a mating schistosoma hematobium pair, Dixon shaking his head, but it is unlikely they would be passed out in the urine or that he would notice them if they, if they were. Um, 
<laughs> she describes their length and that they're very thin. So I suspect this may be another delusion. Speaking of trematodes, I recently came across this paper while looking for something completely different. Social organization in a flatworm. Trematode parasites form soldier and reproductive casts. I think we, we actually presented a paper yes, on that. we did, actually. Yeah, we did. Was it, I don't know. Maybe it may have been the same one. I'm not sure. Yeah, could, be. Yeah. could be. Could uh, be. We, we covered, actually, she says, you covered a paper about social trematodes from some of the same authors yeah. back in 2016. How okay. about that? Uh, back on TWIP 106. But this 2010 paper in which they first described the phenomenon is absolutely worth the read. It's also open access, unlike the paper covered mm. in TWIP 106. Mm. Cheers, Hannah. All right. Brian writes, hello, Twipsters. This was a tough case, but I think our firemen from New York may have schistosomiasis due to S. hematobium, which was likely acquired during his time in Egypt. I think he may also have had a brief infection due to myiasis acquired in Haiti, likely a bot fly. Mm. Dixon. Mm. Okay. <clears throat> Kevin writes, Twip 158 case submission. And he lists the temperature and the uh, overcastness. It's uh, of, of where he's writing from. It's uh, 50, uh, 71 degrees Fahrenheit, 22 degrees centigrade, and overcast. This 50-ish year old man with a conviction that his body is infected with parasites. This case has a very low signal-to-noise ratio. That is, lots of noise, not much signal. I have divided up this patient's findings into three categories, subjective, objective, and unclassified. This will, I hope, filter out much of the background noise that threatens to des derail the diagnostic process and reinforce cognitive biases. Subjective data. Now, there's a lot of writing here, so I'll try to summarize this as best I can. Um, subjective data. White skin lesions that hatch and liberate swimming creatures. Uh, then in italicized, he, he writes his interpretation of this. This dramatic patient report is not consistent with any known arthropod infestation. There are no known insect crustaceans or other invertebrates that burrow and develop in the dermis and liberate an aquatic or free-swimming form. Patient testimony will be held to be at least a misperception and at worst a delusion. The subjective data goes on. Forked-headed worms seen in toilet after defecation, unspecified which orifice produced the worms. And Talis, this is his interpretation. Patients may misperceive detritus in the toilet bowl to be some kind of living creature. Patients are known to bring clinic to clinic all matter of vessels containing floating amorphous fragments. Parenthesis, it is uh, axiomatic that such jars are poorly sealed and possess ill-fitting lids. <laughs> the description of fork-headed does not match any intestinal helminth. His exposure to fresh water in Egypt raises the possibility of schistosome infection, but rectal or urethral passage of adult worms is not expected. Self-collected specimens, samples. Historically, this has been called the matchbox sign, a descriptive, a description of patients who brought a matchbox to clinic containing suspected parasites. Perhaps a bit unfairly, this sign has been used in part as evidence of delusional parasitosis. The matchbox has been given way to Ziploc bags and other containers. Our patient samples can be interpreted as his genuine concern to be listened to and relieved of suffering self-produced video of organisms <clears throat> i classify this as modern version of the matchbox sign see above temporary blindness or transient visual loss the older term for this was hysterical blindness a term that has no doubt been cashiered cashiered a more a neutral description would be a conversion reaction a manifestation of severe Somatoform disorder. Examples of, of physiologic transient blindness are, are hmm. amaurosis fuga. That too. <clears throat> amaurosis <laughs> fuga um, due to embolus or ischemia, though always, almost always monocular. Uh, migraine, giant cell arteritis, uh, optic neuritis, for example, multiple sclerosis, infectious causes of visual loss such as CMV, that's choreo. That's uh, cytomegalovirus, retinitis, lutic retinitis, etc., are not relevant to our case. A thorough retinal examination in syphilis serology should be done. It's highly likely, considering the entirety of the clinical case, that his blindness is psychological in origin. Objective data. 
<clears throat> travel exposure. Haiti, 2009. Egypt, 2009. He's not sure. Patient could have been infected with a wide variety of helminth or arthropod infections, infestations, or bites. However, there is little in his overall history that suggests a specific organism. Hematuria, presumably not self-reported. Patient's freshwater exposure in Egypt raises the possibility of schistosome hematobium infection. He presumably had limited exposure if infected and would likely have a low worm burden more below. Radiographic evidence of bladder wall calcification. Again, raises the S hematobium question, which can be associated with this finding. Other conditions that can cause bladder wall calcification, tuberculosis, various um, urethral, urethral cancers, amyloidosis, post-radiation fibrosis, cytotoxic exposure. Another look at a concentrated urine specimen for OVA and <clears throat> perhaps an nucleic acid amplification test or rectal SNP exam as outlined in PD-6 may rule out the rather low likelihood of schistosomiasis at the risk of entertaining, uh, of entering a foie de doux or folly de doux, uh, whatever that is, empiric treatment <laughs> with praziquantel could be considered. So I, so I come in with that. <laughs> Would you please? <laughs> that, that is always the risk of the, the clinician sort of falls into the delusion. So it's a folly of two. It's a French expression, <laughs> yeah, I believe. Okay, okay. And it goes back into they start and you get excited. Next thing you know, the two of you. Uh, so anyway, we'll, we'll <laughs> get back to that. We certainly will. Uh, facial extremity scrotal excoriations. The dermatologic literature formally used the term neurotic excoriations. I personally do not like the term that patients might misinterpret as demeaning or insulting. The view of our patient's substance abuse history, the diagnosis of drug-induced for formication. formications should be considered. These self-induced lesions are colloquially called coke bugs, meth mites, amphetamites. Patients may also have hypersensitivity reactions to multiple nostrums that he is applying to his skin. Multiple negative laboratory studies. That's a finding. Where there's no smoke, there's probably no fire. Possibly that patient is having post-infection infestation, ongoing puritis, a kind of purigro nor... Nodularis. <laughs> nodularis. Pur Purigo nodularis. Would you please, the physician steps in at this moment and just, just <laughs> does the, the Latin for us. A vicious cycle of scratch itch at infinitum. Absolute eosinophil count of 700 cells per microliter. Eosinophil counts below 1,500 micro cells per microliter are considered to be mild. Note reference below that states, despite extensive evaluation, up to 60% of travelers with eosinophilia never have an underlying cause for their eosinophilia identified. Unfortunately, our patient's low-level eosinophilia contributes little to a strong case for infection or infestation. Finally, to leave no stone unturned, mention should be made of uncommon cases of cutaneous t solium dermal cysts, cutaneous sparganosis, and cutaneous manifestations of Echinococcus. Um, unident unclassified self-report testimony that previous skin biopsy showed arthropods with compound eyes. No, note that only insects, crustacea, and horseshoe crabs have compound eyes. Homo metabolis insects, lar insect larvae, do not have compound eyes, which eliminates myiasis as a consideration. Arachnids, i.e. mites, they have simple evis. Eyes. Eyes. <laughs> the Y didn't show up on my like, eyes. Uh, eyes, and often are eyeless. If there are any factual basis for this highly suspect skin biopsy results, there is a possibility of pseudo parasite detection. Uh, Prince where incidental or household insects such as a sosid or misidentified as an infectious agent. See excellent Matheson reference. Summary. Um, here we go. I believe that this patient may have contracted a cutaneous infestation such as scabies in 2009, which subsequently cleared, but resulted in a chronic self-induced puritic dermatitis. Um... Lichen simplex chronicus or perigo nodularis <clears throat> travel to Egypt may have resulted in a chronic S. hematobium infection. However, the patient's primary problem is an obsessive preoccupation with infection and infestation, including compulsive documentation, self mutilation, and dogged physician seeking. To wit, delusional parasitosis. 
which may be exacerbated by a substance use disorder. He does not seem to have features of the currently fashionable afflicted affliction of Morgellons disease. Psychiatry referral, antipsychotic medication, or cognitive behavior therapy, and treatment for substance use disorder may mitigate his unfortunate state of suffering. All right. Thanks for bringing me to this tango of delusions. <laughs> Not a tangle. It's a tango of delusions. And then he has a whole bunch of notes and references, which I will skip. Yeah, but I, I recommend the listeners go look at the show notes because there's some really nice gems in here. He goes over okay. again a lot yeah. of you don't you don't have to read them, but he goes over a lot of the symptoms and gives references to to consult. And he there's one point where he says he writes, and this is very funny. Accuse me of participating in a folia du, but I searched PD six for <laughs> the words forked head and went a begging. <laughs> <laughs> I do see that too. So. This is a remarkable response to a case history. We haven't had one so um, clearly knowledgeable in the area of uh, psychotic disorders that might resemble um, any number of different parasitic infections. So, um, is an affilia in the traveler conclusions? You want me to read all of this? No, 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 no. You don't have to read. I'm just saying they're they're references for, but he's also n made notes on the references. Right. right, he has, and so I think. And he talks about the salve he's using <coughs> and what could be problems. Yeah, with yeah that. that's right. That's and, right. And different things. It's really good. It's, it's a remarkably good. thorough Lovely. treatment of the disorder. If should that be the case? All right, uh, Daniel, can you take the next one? That's Chris. Certainly. Chris writes, good morning, professors. It is a comfortable 76F here in Stony Brook, New York. So a little follow-up from last episode's questions about ticks in Long Island. <laughs> this <laughs> weekend, I went hiking at Habbard County Park near the South Fork. I smashed my tick record. I found several thousand ticks on me. Oh At first, what I thought were some unusual sticky brown sand on my shoes, I quickly realized were actually thousands of ticks. Mm. Ticks. I noticed this after a fairly intense itching feeling about an hour into my hike. The weird thing is, although I had several thousand ticks on me, the three other people I was hiking with had several less ticks on them by orders of magnitude. Due to the fact that this is the first time I've had a disproportional amount of ticks on me while people near me have had none, I came to the conclusion that my shoes are very <laughs> good for grabbing on and threw them out immediately. So, anyone on Long Island here listening, <laughs> learn from this <laughs> and never forget the deed. Lu right. Lucky, the thousands of bites on me, which look like chicken pox, <laughs> were all from nymph lone star ticks, which don't carry Lyme because it is – this first stage, and they haven't picked up any diseases, excluding the red meat disease that everyone seems to be bringing up when I tell them this story. <laughs> but I'm not too uh, worried about that. I'll throw in some stuff here. Additionally, one last lesson learned from this ordeal is that front line doesn't work for pets on Long Island. The insects have become mm. resistant. Oh, this no. was also learned the hard way as my poor pup was dropping ticks for a few days. He's doing better now, though. Okay, I, I'll just, before we, then he's going to say now into the case. So I'll just make a couple of comments. It's actually, I have to say, getting very interesting to practice infectious disease, you know, thanks to the ticks, I should say. <laughs> we were having a lunch uh, at Columbia on Tuesday, and they had a bunch of the second year medical students who are thinking they might do a career in infectious disease. And I was saying, much like the Canadians, I, I have embraced global climate chaos and uh you know the canadians are happy because right it's going to warm up they're going to have shipping <laughs> in the north it's it's all going to be great grow lots and, more wheat <laughs> <laughs> and, and i was saying i am personally benefiting from from this uh you know that uh we we are seeing a lot of cases of anaplasma in uh coming from actually new jersey i'm going to blame new jersey on that uh just yesterday in clinic i saw a case of uh ehrlichia actually it had been severe enough that this oh, was wow. a hospital follow-up with with a little bit of pneumonia some liver involvement high fever um we see plenty of babesia and actually my morning started off with a gentleman who i had just finished treating for rocky mountain spotted fever which is in the nice. deer ticks so we're seeing the lone star ticks have moved into our area the deer ticks are now um you know as plentiful as ever but they're, they're carrying more things it's been a really long autumn also yeah it's it's exciting stuff well, so I mean, lone stars deer ticks summer, dog ticks know. right right 
Yeah, so exciting, exciting stuff. Uh, okay. <laughs> right. Now back to our regularly scheduled show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> now on to the case. I think that the patient is suffering from schistosomiasis. I think the reported white specks popping off and swimming may just be dead skin falling off due to drug use. Additionally, because he reports being infected with a forked Fork-headed worm. He might be prone to delusional thought, as I can uh, I can't find anything on a forked-head parasitic worm. Some of the reasons I believe he is suffering schistosomiasis is because this parasite can cause elevated eosinophils, calcification of the bladder from the eggs, and is very present in Egyptian fresh water, where it's transmitted in its free-living circaria stage. The negative ONP is a little surprising. Um, if it is just a semisis, this could be a false negative and may take more than one test. Or if it is a new infection, uh, it could not be producing eggs. Although this is unlikely because calcification of the bladder would take time. This was a tough one. I hope I got it right. Now I have a qu- few questions for Vincent about viruses. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's another show. That's a totally so, different podcast here, kids. <laughs> so we'll, we'll cut this out and move it on to TWIB. But maybe our <laughs> listeners like viruses too. Uh, so I know Vincent would very much enjoy sequencing open w- ocean water, as he has mentioned numerous times on TWIV. But what part of the ocean? Is this true, Vincent? You have a uh, yeah, craving? I have a craving to sequence the ocean. But it, it, people are doing this, but I just enjoy it. Very there much, are. Yeah. That's right. Was this a big Venter thing? Didn't he travel around sequencing? Yes. Yeah, I mean, so what Venter did, he, he took his boat and went around the world, but he put a pipe at, I think, six meters depth and that's where he sampled around the world this pipe took in water in different locations at precisely six meters so it's different because they're different life at different depths surface is different from deeper and then of course when you get to the past the photic zone dixon thank you Vince. there'll be different life as well <laughs> that's right you hit the uh, and it's all, line. it's all distinct and even on the bottom of the ocean, there is life, mm. especially around the hot vents. Right. right. So I wanted to interpret this and, from Daniel, by the way. And are you going to? No. When you hit the thermal climb, the sailors call it uh, Davy Jones's locker because you don't come back up from that. <laughs> then we did a paper on TWIV, where be- beneath the ocean floor, there is water circulating. It percolates through the rock, Tons. and there there is life, and there are viruses. People have sampled these as well. It's an incredible world. It is an incredible world. So so th- this basically addresses his questions. He's talking about viruses falling to the bottom. You know, the viruses replicate in the life that exists at the different levels of the ocean. Right. So what you meant, I hope, was that in the rock, there are life forms which harbor viruses. Exactly, exactly. And, there you go. And th- yes, the pressures on the bottom of the ocean are huge, but are. viruses are extremely tiny. So they it's do irrelevant. Not care. <laughs> it's and bacteria irrelevant. don't carry it. But you know, these life forms on, at the vents, you know, these tubular worms yeah. and the pu- incredible crabs with long legs, they are fine. You get used to it. You evolve to be resistant. <laughs> but viruses don't have to worry about it. And, and we've t- talked about this now and then on different episodes after 126. So just be patient yep. and uh, you'll get to it. So you don't have to read any of that anymore. <laughs> no. <laughs> Daniel. All right. So warm regards, Chris. But there's one more here. There's another. Oh, he says, lastly. The, is this Carl writes? Carl no, no. Wright. Read the last or, paragraph oh. of Chris. Lastly, I loved. Oh, uh, yes. So Chris also finishes, concludes with, lastly, I love the most recent episode of TWIP and absolutely love whenever you're, you guys talk about ecological parasitism as it is a fascinating field. I would love to hear you also talk about the dilution hypothesis and possibly bring Dr. Richard S. Ostfeldt um, from the Cary Institute on to talk if you discuss ticks in the future as his work's really cool. I totally Sorry can. for such a long email, but I hope becoming a Patreon helps make up for it. You, know, you, are, you doing okay there, Dixon? You are I late. am. No, yeah. Richard Osfeld and I are go way back. <laughs> uh, we used to come down as a guest lecturer from the, uh, at that point it was called the Institute for Ecosystem Studies. It's in Millbrook. And uh, he's fantastic. The guy is amazing. He studies Lyme disease, but through the perspective of tick ecology Mm. and trees, you know, trees, ticks, and it's all related because the um, Mm -hmm. acorns Mm -hmm. that feed the squirrels and the small animals that harbor the intermediate stages of the ticks are, you know, it's just Mm -hmm. an amazing internet of uh, life forms. And thank you, Chris, for becoming a Patreon. I, we really, oh, that's great. We very much appreciate it. Congratulations. We thank put a star so, after your name. Thank you so much. Carl writes, Dear Twip, 
Everything in this case except the eosinophilia is consistent with delusional parasitosis or delusional infestation, as some people call it. The consulting of many doctors, the injuries produced by repeated scratching, bringing in of samples that are actually innocuous, reporting of biological impossibilities that are horrifying but somehow escape being captured as hard evidence. All these are familiar to anyone who has read a New Yorker article about delusional parasitosis, as I have. I confirmed this diagnosis by consulting an article in Clinical Microbiology Reviews, which is mm-hmm. more prestigious than the New Yorker. <laughs> In some it's people's eyes. <laughs> sad case because it's an intractable and disabling syndrome, but a parasitologist can't do anything about it. You might want to get a brain MRI since in one study about half of people with delusional parasitosis had detectable organic brain problems, and in some cases those were treatable. Failing that, you should refer him to psychiatry. What about the mild eosinophilia? I suggest that the eosinophilia is in fact unrelated to any parasite. Apparently, mild eosinophilia is uh, often of obscure origin, as Kevin wrote. Right. The optimal evaluation of the asymptomatic traveler or immigrant with eosinophilia is uncertain. Up to 50% of such patients never have a cause identified. You should work up the patient for non-parasitic causes of eosinophilia, but not be shocked if you don't find anything, so I'm prepared to ignore it. I never thought... I would use that sentence in a letter to twip. <laughs> <laughs> Ignore the innocent affiliate. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Goodness. Here we go. Seven guesses. Fabulous. All right. And, uh, well, we can add a couple guesses, right? Because Dixon and Vincent. It's true. You, yeah, we will get both true. allowed to weigh in. Uh, Vin, so Dixon already jumped in with some questions. Vincent, did you have any more questions you wanted? No, but I'll tell you what I think is going on here. Okay. Go for it. I think there's there are definitely aspects of delusional parasitosis. I think uh, clearly uh, the this the, the Egypt trip and the bladder lesions strongly suggesting a hem- schistosome, probably an old infection, right? Or still ongoing. I don't know, but that's I think that's probably real. Um, and I think the skin issues are probably him. Uh, with with all these topical things he's putting on, he may be irritating himself. But I don't think there's any infection or infestation in the skin. And um, the, yeah, I, I think the eosinophilia is is nothing. Probably if you do, took a thousand people, you would find that in a fraction of them were fine as these right. articles. So that's my guess, right. unfortunately. Right now, that's a good guess. Then, I think based on the evidence, I would agree entirely with what you just said. Um, I know that it takes a while with fairly uh, moderate to heavy infections with S. hematobium to develop calcifications because mm-hmm. you need a lot of eggs produced and they're trying to get out of the uh, so how venous long plexus. How long would that be? Years. So 2009, wouldn't that be? A- yeah, but he might have had a mild cat. I mean, he was only there for a short time. Yeah. This requires constant exposure for about 10 I years. See. I see. So he didn't have that kind of exposure like most kids have in Egypt when they grow up with this, yeah, right? So, yeah. And blood in the urine definitely wouldn't be there because he didn't have a heavy infection. So maybe a, the test was negative because it was a false negative or maybe it was negative because it was negative. Mm. Uh, there's another way to check. And I, I mean, you could actually go in and biopsy the calcifications mm-hmm. and then you could, you know, obviously see whether those are due to yeah. You know, sequestered yeah. eggs or, or something completely different. Like, I wouldn't know what a, um, a urologist might say about this. If the if you took Egypt out of the equation and asked how many people in the United States who have never had a travel history would also have calcifications in the bladder, mm. I don't know the answer to that. Do you, uh, Daniel? Um, I don't think it's a high percent. And um, and actually, to, to jump in on this, which is you're bringing up some good good things, is the, the chronicity of how long it takes before you get um, mm-hmm. hematuria and calcifications from uh, schistosoma hematobium infection. Mm-hmm. And if you go back to some of the, the early writings when the, um, when the French first show up in um, Egypt and they mm-hmm. talk about they, they talk about a couple of things which are interesting. One, they talk about how the local people have this idea that males starting to have hematuria about the same time that women start to have um, monthly bleeding is they think the, the male form of, of that coming of age. And when you, you treated the boys and the hematuria went away, they were, they were quite upset because now <laughs> you're not a man anymore. Um, I don't know how true some of those interpretations are, but, but at least it helps give you this idea that 
it would be odd for just two or three months in Egypt to give you enough of a schistosome exposure that you would end up with gross hematuria. Yeah. Uh, and with enough eggs that you're going to see the, the peripheral calcifications. Um, so I, he had actually had multiple cystoscopies, multiple biopsies, with mm-hmm. the urologist mm-hmm. not thinking anything about the, the uh, schistosome as a possible, but being more concerned about malignancies, things like that. Sure. And those had all been unremarkable. So, so I, you know, I, I think yeah. it's hard to make too much of the um, of the time in Egypt, but obviously it, it throws something into this you know concern that this gentleman has coming in. Could I have a parasite? I was in Egypt. I have right. hematuria. I have calcifications. Yeah, um, you know, and the though the serology was negative and the repeated ONPs were negative, you can say, oh, those tests have a certain sensitivity, etc. But again, it's does it make sense with what we know about schistosome? And yeah. I don't think it makes yeah. sense to attribute much to what he's presenting with to that time in Egypt. I would agree. And uh, by the way, the Egyptians get their ideas from uh, the writings of the ancient Egyptians, which actually shows uh, hematuria in males on the hieroglyphs. So you can go back 3,000 years. They're, they're still Egyptians. They're not ancient. Someone told me. <laughs> no, no, no. I use that the phrase The modern once. Egyptians get their ideas from the ancient Egyptians. Dixon, I, I used that <laughs> phrase once in a talk, and a guy came up to me and he said, as far as I know, all Egyptians are Egyptians. They're not ancient or so. He didn't like that. Okay, ancient Egyptians. They're all How about Egyptians. The writings during ancient times in Egypt. That's better. By the times, older Egyptians. <laughs> no, the by, times were ancient. That's by fine. Egyptians. Yeah, yeah. That's fine. okay. Yeah. So that's I, I, pre- no, I appreciate that, Vincent. I think we're in the we're in the time where we're aware that words matter and how they you do. phrase stuff. Sure, matters. they do. Sure, uh, they do. Oh. Yeah, so it's always it's always nice to have someone who's sensitive to these things, no helping us to become this. better in every way. Absolutely. Okay. In fact, so it, it was a, it was an email, I think that, that did that. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Daniel. Sorry. Uh, so we 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 went into that a little. Um, now, a couple of our writers brought brought up this concept that I think the two of you are bringing up with delusional parasitosis or Morgellon syndrome, mm-hmm. and I guess we should talk a little bit about what what that is, and I think it's an important thing to make a distinction between someone coming in saying, hey, I think I might have a parasitic infection versus someone who is um, married to it. And I, and I see both. I see people come in and say, oh, you know, I saw something. I was traveling. I'm, I'm concerned. I think I might have a parasite. What do you think? And there's other people that come in, you know, doctor, I have a parasite and I need you to confirm it for me. Right. Um, and so that latter group is a little bit different than the first group. And I, I see a lot more, actually, to be honest, in the first group where they come in and they say, I think I might have a parasite, but I'm here because actually what I really want to know is is what's going on. And I usually try to steer as many people as I can into the first group and say, okay, so what, what do you actually have? which in this case, I have this skin problem. And then, you know, I say, all right, let's figure out whether it's parasitic or not. Mm -hmm. Now, the second group is a little bit more challenging. Um, In this group, basically, there's going to be no, there's going to be no facts that will ever persuade them from their, they they come in with the conclusion, not with a problem that they're trying to understand. Exactly. And, oh, go ahead. I think I, yeah. (laughs) You said, go ahead, then you interrupt. Me. <laughs> well, he doesn't so, go ahead. <laughs> so I, I was going sh- to say, like, so an interesting thing that people threw in there was uh, what's called Morgellons syndrome. And I don't know if that's something um, that a lot of our listeners are familiar with, but it's not synonymous with delusional parasitosis. And um, it's an interesting thing that's been studied where people come in and they're describing these these threads and they're describing they have these issues where there's an irritation on the skin and then these um, these threads are then found. And there's some work suggesting that these these threads are actually made up of collagen. Hmm. So they find these hairs, these threads that almost have like a, a variable color to them. They are perceiving these as parasites, um, but the threads themselves are not living creatures. They've actually done um, high-resolution imaging of these, and it's it's a keratin reaction <laughs> to some sort of um, inflammatory problem, which is not 
very well um, mm. characterized, understood. So it's interesting. I sometimes see people that come in with that. And I, I don't like the term Morgellons because it's tied too much in with this idea of a psychiatric complaint. What, the, what I view is they're coming in with an unexplained skin disorder that they, right. through Googling on the internet, have concluded or, or come to think is a parasitic infection. Now, now this man doesn't describe that. He doesn't describe these hairs or these fibrils or anything like that. What he's coming in with, as we later find out, is really horseshoe crab infestation. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> right. It's referring to the compound I think. Yeah. And so he's coming in with this really severe skin manifestation. And when I when I first meet him, he describes this relationship to the first time he goes to Haiti. You know, it's many years later. So I don't know if when he went to help out in the um, hurricane relief effort, if at that point he actually developed some infection, which is now not present. And he's now dealing with sort of a post-traumatic um, you know, issue. And I do see this quite a bit. People get pinworm infection and then they're really traumatized. They're pretty sure they mm. always have pinworms anytime anyone bo anything bothers them. Or someone will get a scabies infestation um, in Haiti, in the United States, in anywhere. And then they'll always be worried it's coming back. And any slight thing gets them to scratching and probing and and doing other things. So, so in this case, um, he was sent to me, I think, because there was concern that maybe there had at one point been a parasitic, an ectoparasitic infection. But despite all the, you know, the investigations, I don't think there's evidence that he had any kind of ongoing ectoparasitic infection when he came to see me. Right. Yeah, I was going to add, you know, just to the, um, to the commonality of this and that even in my early days as a technician, I described one episode where a guy came in with his own microscope and he was convinced that he had dog tapeworm, mm. which is of course impossible. You can't have that little tapeworm that infects the dog. What you get is the hydatid cyst, <laughs> which is huge, right? But it doesn't show up on a microscopy examination. So when he came in, uh, the director of the lab, Dr. Harold Brown was very uh, cautious, but, uh, accommodating and he allowed him to sit in one of the corner uh, st stools and sit down at the desk with his microscope and look as much as he wanted at his own fecal sample. And if he saw anything of interest, he'd raise his hand and, and he said, you, you go and he pointed to me. He says, go over there and confirm whether or not what he's looking at is real. And I, I did all day long and he found nothing that looked real. At the end of the day, he says, well, Doc, what do you think is going on? He called me Doc, and of course I wasn't. And I said, you know, I think you're cured. <laughs> <laughs> and he says, do you really think so? And I said, yeah. And he, he walked out with a big smile on his face. He was Actually, probably – You should have been a doctor. <laughs> he should have been a psychiatrist <laughs> maybe or something. <laughs> no, but the other one was that Dr. Roger Williams, our medical entomologist on call here, so to speak – uh, had had many examples of this, and one that he used to relate to his class was that this woman kept showing up saying that bugs, uh, uh, parasites were crawling out of her ears and nose. Mm, yeah. But she could never catch them because they were so fast. So one day, I mean, after many times of approaching uh, many of us, particularly him, though, of course, uh, she ended up bringing some, and she says, I finally caught them. Mm -hmm. So she takes this little, it was a matchbox, by the way, it was absolutely right, it was a matchbox, and they opened them up and they were carpet beetles. Huh. They were tiny little brown carpet beetles. Maybe they did come out of her ear. <laughs> no, well, she put them there to begin with because they don't. Well, they she don't was really, lying on the carpet and it crawled. No, 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 no that's not. <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> that's, it's not a, that's not even possible. <laughs> not even possible. You can have. You know what you can have though. You can have earwigs and you can have cockroaches. Earwigs are in your ear. Sometimes, but you can have cockroaches. I know people that have gotten a history of cockroach in their ear. All right. So, it's a strange stuff happens, and you have to throw all the possibilities out on the table before you eliminate the ones that are obvious, and then you get to this stuff, and then. This is tough. So what is he going to do, right? Yeah. So when I first met this gentleman, I saw him for quite a while. Um, it was, you know, he came in and his skin was really just a mess. So over time, I was able to convince him to use less and less of these topical and, and things that he was using. And the skin got better and better. Um, now, at this point, he's he is much improved. He's actually off getting a uh, second opinion at the Cleveland Clinic as we speak. Uh -huh. um, but he is much improved. The the skin inflammation things get have gotten better. And I think a lot of it was he was 
maybe making things worse. I, I do think he was making things worse by all his attempts to improve it mm-hmm. uh, with all these different topical preparations he was putting on that would give temporary relief, but long-term sort of triggering of more inflammation. How about asbestosis as a confounding factor? How was his pulmonary function and his uh, – because sometimes foreign objects – when they lodge deep inside the lung, can it do eosinophilia, for instance, because you develop an allergic reaction to it and stuff? Yeah. I don't know. So, Just- so no, no, that's a good. It's a good thing. And I, and actually, I guess this is what was brought up in one of the emails. Um, these are sort of the last people you want to just sort of jump into, you know, the, the folly of do the folly of two, which is to, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, he, he, the best thing for him is no more testing. I mean, he's been tested mm-hmm. multiple times, lots of his mm-hmm. body pieces have been taken off, sent to the lab for years. The most important thing I think for these people is to go through it and think of it. Does any of this make biological sense? And how do we make you better rather than just subject you to more tests? But but I will say, and this is interesting that a couple of people commented about, when you read some of the reviews of people that I, I shy away from using the term delusional parasitosis, but people who present concern that they have a uh, parasitic infection, and I've even seen the paper, like, you know, causes of delusional parasitosis. Some of these papers, 20% of them have um, pinworm, for instance. Oh, um, really? And so I look at that, I'm saying, well, then they really don't have delusional parasitosis. <laughs> and I've definitely had people come to me with the, like, you know, this person has these delusions and here they are, and they have something. So it is important that you actually make the diagnosis, treat what they have. And so, you know, you start off with this called upside down pyramid, you know, back to Egypt, right? Um, people <laughs> who think they might have a parasite, but have something else. And, and it might be an inflammatory thing. I, I've diagnosed people with hep C and you treat the hep C and wow, this itching and skin manifestation that was driving them crazy is now better or they have something else. Yeah. And then you get down to sort of the bottom of the people that I said was sort of on the right. They come in, they are certain they have a parasite, and they will do anything to prove it, um, even to the point of catching carpet beetles and bringing them to you or scooping up earthworms or whatever else. Sure. I mean, remember the poor woman with her four children from Lyme, Connecticut, that was convinced that there was something wrong with her children because they weren't behaving normally. They were always sick. They were always malazed, except for one. The girl, mm-hmm. the fourteen-year-old girl, <clears throat> and uh, she took them to virtually every pediatrician within a hundred-mile radius of Lyme, with no success. The more she visited for a diagnosis, the more the communications uh, in the area had said, "There's a woman that's going to come to see you. She's got four children. She's crazy." Mm-hmm. So she got so fed up with this system that she went to Washington D.C. She went to the NIH. She said, you're a federal laboratory, you're, a, you're obliged to listen to me, you're obliged to do every single test. There's something wrong with my children, and you're going to find out what it is. One of them isn't sick, three of them are. That was the story. And what are you going to do with this, right? It's hysterical mother with, come on, you know what they found, of course? They found Lyme disease in the three children. Why not in the fourth child? Why didn't the, all the other doctors that you went to find it? Though? <laughs> no, because we didn't have it then. This was the first. These were that the, was the first. These were the zero no, I didn't first cases. So, but why didn't the girl have it? And she had acne, and she was being treated with tetracycline. Okay, and she, she was yeah. cured. <laughs> no, but I, I like that story because I think it's really important as a physician to be humble. And I, yeah, that's you know, right. We, we, particularly I, I do not know everything. And so when people come in, and and you know, you mentioned Lyme. We we didn't know that Lyme was there. Nope. Um, you know, I I had a woman, you know, and we we know about HIV. But I had a woman a couple months back when she was, oh yeah, she's kind of malingering, and it was acute HIV. I mean, so even wow. stuff, even stuff we know, people are quick to write off. Um, so I, I see a fair number of patients um, who, you know, if you went back ten or twenty years, we we didn't have testing for Ehrlich ear anaplasmosis, so we didn't right. have Rocky Mountain spotted fever in the area. So, oh, so I, I, oh yes, you yeah. did. Yes, you did. Actually, you did. Sorry. I must yeah, correct actually, you on that one. You you are correct because my uh, stepsister, when she was a teenager, got it. So yeah. I'll, I'll 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 agree with you. <laughs> but no, so I, I think but Lyme. It's, no, we, we had yeah. it, but we didn't know what it was, right? Yeah, no, I, and I think that's it. I think we have to be humble, and so I'm really. It's really rare that I will label someone as delusional parasitosis. Exactly. I will usually say. I can't identify a parasite. A lot of what you're saying doesn't make biological sense. 
Um, and it's tough because some people have psychiatric issues and you don't want to err on the other side where you, where you don't really get those people the help they need. Uh, but at the same time, I'm very hesitant to say, I know everything and I can tell you this is not an infection. Right. Trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And your urine is sterile. But anyway. <laughs> right. No, we, 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 we do trust doctors, though, because we're, we're told to. And you should. But when they start to steer you in directions that you know are against what you really know about your own body and how it behaves, then I think you should switch doctors and find one that resonates better with let's both step on this side of the disease and together we're going to solve this problem. Now let's start from scratch and let's go from here. And that, and you know, that, that actually works. That actually works. No white coat syndrome, just two people trying to figure out what's wrong with one of them. And they both cooperate together, and they both work together, and they both trust each other. And then that's the ideal situation. There are very few people that actually behave that way all, to, all, all the time. But when you find someone like that, you appreciate them very much so. And I, I knew several people here at our medical school like that. And so I use them as my gold standard when I interview for medical school now. <laughs> So what was the resolution here? Did I, did I miss it? <laughs> so no, no. So we, we were able to get him to reduce using all these um, salves that, that okay. were actually making things worse. So he was much improved. Okay. Um, he's doing quite a bit better. He still feels like he wants an answer. So he's at the Cleveland Clinic um, getting seen by multiple people to see if there's any stone that was left unturned. Yeah. What what were the drugs that he was using? You never mentioned those, but you must have had a list. Actually, no. One of our emailers, yeah, Kevin, um, Kevin picked up. Oh, right? okay, okay. Kevin, um, and he was making this this salve. Let me see if I can find his salve. He was it was the ammonium bitumino sulfonate, um, and yeah. he was or ichthamol, and he was mixing. He was making this drawing salve or black ointment, and he was mixing this with uh, cloves, a clove oil, and I, I think even though this, I think particularly because of the clove oil, would give him sort of immediate relief, it was actually triggering um, more inflammation. So when I got him to stop doing this, he actually would come into the office looking like a, a normal individual where initially he just his, all his skin was flaking off and he had horrible involvement in much. Wow. So I think he has an inflammatory skin issue, which I don't quite understand, but he was making it much, much worse. So he was not a... a, 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 a a substance abuser in the sense of the typical substances you think about cocaine or heroin or any of those drugs. Well, I, you know, I would say, I would say two things in answer to that is one is unfortunately this gentleman does have an issue and he's unable to get off, um, substance abuse oh, okay. and uh, and yes not just marijuana okay. um, but the other is you know we tend to paint those people a certain way or people tend to paint them a certain way but remember this is a this is a firefighter who survived 9 11 this is a gentleman that went down to haiti to help with the um earthquake uh, with okay. the earthquake that's I mean, right that's so right this, this is a good guy i mean i think he's a good guy but he's just he's suffering and he's got some challenges like many of us have right so you think psychiatric help would help in this case? Um, I, I think, and for a lot of people, yes. And this individual, yes. If he would be willing and open to that. Right. Which he is not. A lot of people think of it as not being treated for a disease, and therefore it's like, you're calling me crazy. Can prescribe drugs. Really not true, right? I mean, psychiatrists can. Of course so Daniel, they can. What, of course they can. Do you know what psychiatric drugs would be appropriate for these conditions? So it really would it would really be a, a matter of getting that sort of pinned down what e what exactly is going on here and so and I don't have a psychiatric diagnosis for this gentleman at this point mm -hmm. uh, you know what is driving he clearly has substance abuse disorder um, mm -hmm. so must have lost a lot of friends in that nine eleven yeah of course episode. Yeah, you're not you're not going to come out of that. And he was actually in one of the districts that was you know had a lot of people not so, surviving. So a possible diagnosis is PTSD, right? Yeah. yeah. No, I mean, I would I would find I would be very hard pressed not to say that he has some degree of that after what he's been through. Yeah. Wow. Wow. All right. Actually, we do get letters from time to time, which I generally don't read from people who have been to many doctors and yeah no uh, it's, I, I this, refer them all to daniel because he's this, the physician i have call. this and that and um <laughs> i try i don't i don't i just want to leave daniel alone because you know <laughs> why would you do the parasite ones for daniel <laughs> parasite only but the, you know the ones where 
to have match boxes and see multiple <laughs> doctors. I don't. But we right. do get them, yeah. Yeah. And I feel badly because they're reaching out and they I mean, find podcasts and it's part of what they're trying to Chronic say. fatigue syndrome has a lot of no, but that's characteristics not, of that. Uh, that's not a psychosomatic illness. No, 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 no. But At all. Maybe some of them were. Uh, you got to be careful there, Dixon. <laughs> I'm being careful. I'm trying to be I don't think careful. that it is a clearly a... Uh, not a psychosomatic illness, and people have have looked at that, and there's there are multiple things going on there. Yeah, Dixon's going to get hate mail now. He's really he's getting, putting himself out there. I do. Should we give no. away? Should we give away a PD six? Sure. Yes. We had seven guesses, so let's yep. do random number one to seven. The number is four. The number four would be now. We're going to start getting into the case where. Uh, we we get duplicate winners, right? <laughs> because we have more or less the same people. One, two, uh, three, four is Brian. Winner. Okay, Brian, you thought it was schistosomiasis. So send us your address, twip at microbe.tv. If you're here in the U.S., that's all we need. If you're overseas, we'll also need a phone number. And we will ship you a signed copy of PD6. Thank you for your participation. Indeed. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's right. It's a very difficult case. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. All right. We have a paper. Indeed. For you, which um, is published in PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases. The title is Impact of Repeated Annual Community-Directed Treatment with Ivermectin on Loiasis parasitological indicators in Cameroon, implications for onchocerciasis and lymphatic filariasis elimination in areas co-endemic with Loa Loa in Africa. Right. First author is Samuel Wanji. The last author is Peter Enyong. This comes from the University of Buea in Cameroon, the Research Foundation for Tropical Diseases in Cameroon, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, and the African Program for Onchocerciasis Control in Burkina Faso. Mm. Daniel, I think you ought to give us the backstory here. Yeah, please. <laughs> I am excited to give the backstory. <laughs> and even the that, front story. <laughs> and even the front story. You know, a lot of um, helminth infections, a lot of parasitic infections throughout the world are addressed not by a I'll say the traditional model that we think of where a, an ill patient comes to a physician. Rather, they are often addressed through these mass treatment campaigns. And one of the challenges we find in certain areas is where there might be more than one parasitic infection. And treatment of one parasitic infection might actually cause an adverse reaction because of a second um, infection present. And so we've talked in the past about river blindness and the ivermectin mass campaigns. But unfortunately, and also filariasis is a, is a similar disease that's treated with mass drug campaigns. Unfortunately, sometimes when you try to treat people with one or the other of those, and it's a population with loa loa, and the lower loa is at high levels, you can actually end up having, and, and I'm going to define what I say, adverse reactions. And what is adverse reactions? In some cases, it's death or permanent neurological um, dysfunction, permanent encephalopathy. And so Dixon and I were at a, um, at a talk at the Explorers Club, right, within, within yep. the last year. We were. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a group that uh, tries to get medicines out there for people with, as we say, neglected tropical diseases. And they were one of the people that was telling a story about, they went to this village and, and it was part of this ivermectin campaign. And they, they convinced everyone, this is really important, we got to do this. And you, you give the drugs out to this whole village and there's you know, a thousand or more people in the village, a huge village. And then... Of course, the, it would be the one person who has the bad reaction is the son of the leader of this um, group ends up dying. And you're, you're done. I mean, you're never coming back. No, no sort of guarantee that, oh, well, you know, it's a one in a thousand risk. Um, one in a thousand, that's a person who just died. And it was because they had actually, in this case, the, the idea was they probably had given ivermectin to someone with a very high low, low account. So the challenge in these areas is looking at how you might do this. And what they're talking about here, you'll say, well, but they're doing this. They're giving ivermectin. 
they're doing ivermectin at these low doses, uh, not at a full sort of treatment thing. And they're trying to see like what happens when they do this. And we're going to see that we get a, a bunch of different levels they talk about. They'll talk about greater than 30,000, which is what I'm going to say is when you actually see the death, the severe encephalopathy, um, less or greater than 2,500. And um, so this is the challenge that we're, we're dealing with here is how are these campaigns going to work? What is the impact going to be of ivermectin on these other diseases? And raising the issue that in some areas they, they make this decision and they say, you know, if the prevalence of oncocircle nodules exceeds 20% in a population, that's a cutoff you'll see them use, then this is a severe enough disease that we're willing to take that risk mm-hmm. that you might have some right. people do poorly. Um and and that's tough. Not every community is excited about that. You got to be careful going in that you understand this. Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, so that's that's the background I'm going to throw at everyone. Right. right. And you have to tell people. You can't not tell them. Obviously, but a lot of people hmm, they don't understand scientific thinking because they're not trained. They have no schooling. Um, they're mistrustful of people of not their I would say uh, ethnicities. So these are people that in the past have done more harm than good by instituting programs. Uh, it doesn't matter what the program either is. I mean, you can supply water or maybe you're going to give iron therapy to everybody because you want to cure anemia. And unfortunately, you exag- exacerbate malnourished people who are harboring smoldering infections of Plasmodium falciparum, which happened when the new country of Bangladesh was established by treated everybody with iron therapy because they knew they had a lot of hookworm there. So they, oh, I'm going to do a lot of good. And they go in and I don't know how many people died from that, but more than just one in a thousand. That was very, very sad. And, mm. and they had to withdraw their th- treatment immediately. And, and they were obviously motivated to do something really good, which turned out to be something really bad. Now you have a, a cure for that program. You can go back in there and say, Oh no, we figured out what was wrong. They say, <laughs> like, Daniel says they want they don't want to know you anymore. Yeah, you know, the whole new group has to come in if they're going to make it work. Right. So this study was done in Cameroon, right, where they're yeah. treating four different places, right? four or five different places of Cameroon, where there one was a control, one was a control. We got southwest, two northwest, east, east, non treated and east treated. Yeah. Right, right. And they said to people, he said, "If you want to participate, we need blood." We do. To do a thick smear to look for... The microfilm area. Of... Loa, loa. Which are clear, right? Clear. Clear Very as a clear. bell. They are. And they could count them, right, per That's mil. Right. Now, remember, this is... They're, they're treating people in an Oncocerca control zone. Right. Okay, so think of where the microfilm area for Oncocerca are found. Uh, in the eye? No, they're found in the skin. So taking blood is a perfect way of detecting loa loa without confusing it yeah. with Oncocerca because the larvae don't live in this in the blood. But there's another filarial worm that lives there, and that's witcheraria. So now you have to distinguish between the microfilaria of witcheraria mm-hmm. and the microfilaria of loa loa. And that requires, you know, a did, little bit of skill. They, I don't recall them doing that. I mean, so they, well, they, they do a certain, I'll call it a little trick, mm-hmm. is that there's a different periodicity to when each microfilaria uh, is in the blood. Right. So they're, so they're drawing the That's blood right. between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m., right. which is when you see the lower, lower microfilaria in the blood. And people might remember, um, Wucheria bancrofti is going to be present in the blood at night. And this actually has to do with the biting habits of the vectors. Or the, yeah, sure. I mean, eventually it favors that. Uh, you might say that it's, it's a characteristic of the microfilaria for both of those species. Mm. Because where do they go during the daytime then? Yeah. yeah. They go to, around to the uh, lungs, lungs, around the lung fields, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's very, very interesting. So it's a fascinating biology. So they had 3,600 people in the treatment Project sites, 900 that's from the non-treatment. That's a lot of people. Getting blood ages 10 to 95 years of age. A lot of people. You know, I wonder how many 95-year-olds, because these are communities with lots of infectious it diseases, is. and they're, they still they can live to 95. Well, there's a saying there, right, Daniel? Well, you want to say it, or should I say it? <laughs> well, why don't you say it, and then I'm going to chime in. Okay, well, they say if you live past the age of five, you'll live to 95. 
because most yeah, so of the that, diseases they die from are in childhood. Really? Yeah, yeah, that that's an interesting. Yeah, and I and I think that's a misconception that people have. They say, oh, people in the you know, developed world in modern times live longer, and what it really is is more people live longer. Right. Um, you know, you you go back and you read some of these things. You're like, wait a second, this person I'm reading about here, I am, you know, 500 um, before the Common Era. This person's in their 80s. Wait, people didn't live that long. And that's exactly what happened is if you made it past five, if you made it past 20, you were right. good for a while. 20, that's right. And so it's it's interesting. There were, there were kind of a couple sort of bottlenecks. And if you made it past there, you were going to live. So, yeah, there will be the same hmm. – um, there will be the same, I guess, I don't know, age extremes, yeah. but the average, which is, you know, more people making it past those two sort of checkpoints, tough. past the age of one, past the age of five, past the age of 20. Once you make it there, you're in pretty good shape. Now, I will say that dynamic's been slightly modified with HIV, so we have another this bottle another thrown bottle. in. So this, this paper actually has an age pyramid. Yeah. The and 90 look at how spread are, out it is at the bottom, though. Yeah. Look at how many young people Not there many are. Not many people are 90 plus. No. But, wait, but, but Vincent, what about the next level beyond the lowest level? Well, 10 to 14. Then we have ah, right. 21 to 20. Isn't that a huge jump, though, between the first level and the second mm -hmm. level? It's enormous. You know what that... So that means a lot of kids are dying. How many... Well, it's a percentage of the entire population. Mm. Basically, so, half of, you can see, half of the kids that make it to 10 don't make it to 30. Right. Yeah. It's huge. Um, yeah. And right. then, unfortunately, half of the kids that are born don't even make it to 10. Well, that's yeah. the other point. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. right. That's right. Which All is right. not even on this pyramid. So, Daniel, what did they find? Um, they basically found that <laughs> sort of simple thing. It's complicated. Is, it's complicated. I, I was I, I dumb it down, but I was going to say <laughs> what what they're founding, and I think this is interesting. Is once you have these um, ivermectin programs in place, you were seeing very few people, very low incident people with very high levels of loa loa. Right. Um, clearly, people very few people would let's say went with DEC where you need. Microfilaria below a certain level. DEC, you should probably DEC. describe that. Should I talk about that? Just okay. say what yeah. it is. So, diethylcarbamazine is, is, <laughs> is, another, is another Helminth treatment that, right. that we'll use. I think we had a case where we've talked about that. But it's one of the ones where if the uh, mm. the microfilaria of low and lower are above 2,500, it's the cutoff. If they're above that, you'll use things to get it below that before you use DEC. Otherwise, um, the incidence of adverse reactions, I want to make clear, that's people developing you know, brain damage or sure. dying. And you can you can get an adverse reaction to DEC too. Well, that's what I'm saying. If you, yeah, not only can you get a bad reaction to DEC, and they do like a spot test with that, but they you can get a bad reaction um, if you have low low co infection with right. the filaria above a certain level. Yeah. And so what they're finding here, and I, I think this is important, that if you're out there doing the um, ivermectin treatment, you're not only treating your target oncocerca, but you're also treating loa loa. And they try to bring up the fact that, you know what, you may want to do that. All those people that say loa loa is innocuous and has no symptoms, they may not actually be correct. <laughs> so there may be a, a benefit to treating loa loa. And yet, in the same paper, they identify a region of Cameroons mm. which have a very high level of loa loa mm -hmm. and no compliance for using ivermectin. Yeah, And that they speculated in the discussion that this was because perhaps there were a lot of adverse reactions yeah. in the very beginning of the program. Sure. And they say, nope, nope, it's not allowed here. I'm yeah. sorry, we're not going to do it. And so they have one region, which is, it's kind of the control for the, the problem that you were talking about before, yeah. Daniel, about, yeah. you know, just general, uh, uh, general acceptance of a procedure that's got everybody benefits except for a few. So they also look, they look at two things, the percent of people that are microfilaria positive and also the the levels. Mm -hmm. And basically the more doses of ivermectin you take, you know, the, it pushes it down. The fewer people are going to have it, but it never gets rid of it entirely. Vincent, right? it just gets right. keeping getting lower and, and lower, lower and lower. lower. <laughs> yes, I know. So, <laughs> so, but one of the things they know is, enjoy that? <laughs> is that, uh, it never goes it never goes away entirely so is that something that would happen with continued treatment you keep there's how, one district that where that actually how happened. many years would you need this is once a year they had 12 no, i think they had 12 
continuous doses. Twelve years worth of uh, ivermectin, and you had one group that had no worms. So it's so, once a year only, right? Yeah, that's right, exactly right. right. Yeah, because some of these are exactly. four, five, six so times. We should also say that the control program for onchocerciasis is trying to prevent the production of microfilariae, not killing off the adult worms, right? Because yeah, ivermectin yeah. doesn't do that. But it keeps it but stays for, in the system for a long time. But for loa loa, it does kill worms, right? Yeah, and it also kills the microfilaria as well. So it and kills both of those. Everybody's killed. So that means you you know I bet you there's another study that's going to come out of this because they're going to go back and look at what is the minimum level of lowering the loa loa infection below the vector transmission zone. Right? How many do you have to get below before the vector doesn't pick it up in a blood meal? Is that the only mode of transmission from person to person for this? No it's animal vector. Chrysops. No, there's no uh, known animal vector uh, reservoir. And the, the bug, the, the, the fly that transmits this, it's a deer fly. You know how deer flies are painful bites, and they take a little bit of a while to actually suck up the blood. So it's a miracle that this even gets transmitted because mm. anybody who's ever been bitten by a horse fly or a deer fly, if you go canoeing on a river and you run across a zone where they've just had a hatch of deer flies, <laughs> you know, you want to get out of there as fast as you can. So these poor kids are being bitten hundreds of times a day, perhaps, and they accumulate this infection very fast. Mm. So, you know, but but there is a, there is a uh, mathematical formula that can be applied to this. The epidemiologists were very good at doing this with regards to mosquitoes and malaria. How many how 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 many people have to be malaria free in a malaria transmission zone before the transmission is broken? So you don't have to treat everybody; you just have to treat a lot of people with heavy infections, and then mm. the ones with low infections don't pass it on. So that's that's the way nature behaves. So there there's another concept here that you have to throw on top of this whole thing, because Daniel, when you plot out for these populations the number of worms per person that you can estimate by the uh, microfilarial load, you'll find most people have a very low level of infection. And then you've got this 1% or 2 or 5% with lots of worms and lots of mm. microfilaria, and they're giving it to everybody else, and they're called wormy people. I know that doesn't sound like a nice term because the epidemiologists weren't thinking very clearly when they came up with that, but there are people that are hyper- susceptible to these infections, okay? And that's true for every infection, and they're not the same people. And they've done these studies again and again for schistosomiasis, for malaria, for viral infections, for bacteria, for uh, protozoan infections of all kinds. And and there are this, uh, this skewed distribution of some people are not susceptible at all, like to the AIDS virus, right? So there are there's a small group of people that are not susceptible. And then there's a gradient of susceptibility that goes up. And then all of a sudden, you've got this big peak at the end. And say, what are those people? Who are they? And if we could identify them beforehand, of course, then you could do something epidemiologically with that data. But right now, I don't think we can do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the conclusion of this study is. Because in the end, they say <laughs> right. this shows that Ivermectin's never going to get rid of LOA because of these not these perceived effects. So there are always going to be people that don't take it. And they say we need more drugs for LOA. LOA. <laughs> we need more drugs for onchocerciasis too. So they were thinking maybe we can give the. Why do uh, you need more drugs for onchocerciasis? Because well, it doesn't be, get rid of the right. infection. So you can say yeah. maybe they're going to treat the Wolbachia infection in the yeah, circle, right. right? Yeah. They said so. That's right. a that's an interesting uh, take on that. I think. Yeah. yeah, Daniel, do you? Have a take yeah, on. I'll I'll yeah I'll throw in a couple. It'd be one is I, I mentioned DEC before it came up. Now DEC given mm-hmm. with usually one or two treatment courses can cure lower lower right. So it it is a curable disease. Right. Um, the second thing is. Um, it doesn't have Wolbachia. It's unique in that. Loa Loa is the one that doesn't right. have the endosymbionts. That is correct. So, so Doxy basically targeting Wolbachia won't help here, but it will help. And the other is this brings up this challenge is when you try to treat these other, you know, Anca Circa, you try these control programs, as we saw here, this clear evidence that when you have adverse um, impacts, um, these adverse effects, there's communities, they remember this and they're not willing to let no you question. use ivermectin. No there. So that's, so we need other approaches <laughs> that don't have the toxicity that actually cure it. So we don't have to come in with these control programs that go on forever and ever and right. just keep mm. cycling in billions. We, we want to, we want to cure these exactly. diseases. We want to 
uh, eliminate them and stop ongoing transmission. So that that does raise the question then: if if you could get rid of Wolbachia in Uncasirca, you will avoid all of the pathology from the infection, mm-hmm. all of it. It goes away, mm-hmm. but you don't break transmission. Wolbachia doesn't affect microfilaria. Right. It doesn't affect its transmissibility. So you 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 will have lots of of of. Uh, of onchocerciasis in an area where there's no disease, but you've got a huge number of people that are infected. The moment you stop treating with doxycycline, it's just going to be horrible. Mm. And what if Wolbachia becomes resistant to Wolbachia? Could, right? To, to doxycycline, right? Of course sure, it can. Could. Of course. So you're saying it's not the answer. It's not the answer. All right. Definitely not the answer. You, you agree with that, Daniel? I, I don't think it's the answer. And um, I th- believe that we did a paper, it was on Gleevec, where they were looking at that. Yeah, that's, right. Ex- that's right. Expensive small molecule, but maybe not so expensive if there isn't patent issues. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, we, yeah. Right. Mm. So it's a conundrum. They're, they're stuck with a very difficult epidemiological problem. Yeah, but I, I thought that, you know, we, we talk a lot about these molecular studies, but I thought what was nice about this is this is what's going on right now with mass drug campaigns and trying to better understand their impact. And and where are we going with these? Are we done? Do we do we still need research into new approaches? Yes, because so, these current ones are just the finger in the dike. They're not actually getting us to where we want to be. Exactly. What about a new diagnostic test that can be done uh, maybe a whole body scan that you can actually pick up the number of adult worms in the skin from Loa Loa without. They mentioned some cool. Yeah, like that, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know uh, that I know there's a um, a lateral flow um, which might be quantitative for Oncocerca, which is nice. Um, instead of having to do all these skin biopsies and microscopic exams, if you right. could just do. That's it, Daniel, where they mention this uh, this diagnostic, which they say you could do on your phone. Yes. Well, microscopic. Oh, that's uh, what did they call it? Yeah, it's a microscope, it? right? It's, a, it's um, fantastic. Yeah, it's a little thing you clip on your phone. It's called the loascope, right? <laughs> yeah. So a no, it's, loascope, it's a smartphone-based video scope, which allows quantification of low microfilaremia within two minutes after a finger prick. Maybe it's like a hanging drop preparation. You make a little video. You make a video. Yeah, no, they have the, a little device that attaches to um, the older iPhones. I don't know if they probably just changed the little adapter now. And um, the images, um, a lot of these systems, actually the images are shot up to a satellite so that they go to a central computer, which amazing. analyzes them, bounces them back. Um, and it is amazing, these these iPhones, these smartphones out there, and it is, most of this technology is iPhone-based. They actually, they're little powerful computers. And you tie that in with the ability to connect to a a more powerful commuter, computer through a cellular network or through a satellite or whatever you're doing. And it's amazing. And diagnostics are great. Wow. This is exciting stuff. I Yeah. Do you see any more field studies that this group has to do before they um, move on to another related problem? Oh, I think they'll keep doing field studies. I mean, the the thing with all these elimination campaigns is you have to constantly pay attention to what's going on. Yeah. Um, so. Well, the point is that I'm going to raise here is that what if they suddenly decide that they've eliminated Uncle Circa because they've given enough ivermectin? Then we've got still to make every country filarial free and well, Loa free. The, and that's, no, that's, that's right. So then they may not have the infrastructure that they have now for doing these surveys. Yeah. Because I know that they need evaluations for the Uncle Circa programs, but they don't necessarily need them for which area or for Loa Loa. Yeah which is uh, going to be too bad when it disappears. So lamenting the loss of a parasite <laughs> results in the, the the worry about two more parasites that we should have been worried about at the same time that we aren't. So, okay, so we have a hero. Hero. We do. Let's, you need let's, to get a heroin one of these days. Let's, <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> I'm drug-free. Um, <laughs> so Funny th- we're doing these by alphabetized um, presentation in the sixth edition of our new new book, uh, I should say a new edition of an old book, but so in this case, it's uh, William Boog Lishman, MD. Do you know oh. who else? A very well-known person who had the nickname Boog Powell. Very good. Yeah, he was a first baseman for the Baltimore Orioles. He was a fantastic baseball player. Um, 
he was born in 1865, which is a propitious year for the United States, at least the end of the Civil War, and lived until 1926. He was enlisted in the British Army and stationed in India. And Leishman joined the British Medical Service, was stationed in India, and worked on the etiology and clinical aspects of typhoid fever and Kala Azar, uh, an unknown, a commonly recognized illness of unknown etiology. Leishman described a new infectious agent in a pathology specimen obtained from a patient who had died of Calazar. Remarkably, Charles Donovan, who we've already chronicled in our Heroes book, also worked in India in the British Medical Service and made an identical discovery and at around the same time as Leishman's observations, except in a different place in India. Both people submitted reports to the British Medical Journal, who in that moment was being edited by none other than Sir Ronald Ross, and they were two years or three years apart in terms of their submission dates, but Ross held on to one of these papers until they could get confirmation that this was the case. And so, says like Donovan, Leishman wrote up his observations and submitted the paper to the British Medical Journal. Ronald Ross, then editor for that journal, recognized the similarity in the two reports three years apart, and he put them together and decided to name the organism Lishmania Donovani to honor both of them. Now, I must say that that should have united these two guys forever. Every time there was a cocktail party around the Tropical Medicine Society of uh, London, they should have, you know, raised a glass and saluted Ronald Ross and said, thank you, sir, for naming an organism after us. They actually ended up both hating each other because both of them wanted the full credit for discovery. Mm -hmm. And so that was too bad. But... Um, Nonetheless, together, they uh, pinned down the etiology of this infection, and then sometime just shortly after that, they showed that it was a vector-borne infection, and then uh, they could start working on the control of this infection. And uh, so that was quite a remarkable uh, discovery to find out that it's A, an infectious disease, and B, it's vector-borne. So there you go. Thank you. We that was our hero. Richmond. All right. And finally, we have hopefully a new case Study for oh, you Dr. Know, Griffin. I have a feeling, this is just Wait. in my bones, <laughs> that there might be just one more left in that bag of yeah, patients okay. that he keeps. <laughs> we we do, you know, and the bag keeps being filled. See, see I told you, I knew it, I knew it. Uh, but let's, we're going to go back to India today. Oh. And we're going to go back mm. to a, a gentleman in his 20s uh, that I saw in the hospital there during the rainy season. So it's the rainy season. I'm in southern India. And this gentleman comes in um, with a week of just sort of feeling achy, not feeling quite so well, fever. And he's got um, severe pain in the right upper part of his uh, belly. He's been vomiting. He hasn't been coughing. Uh, he isn't jaundiced, he's not turning yellow or anything. He doesn't report any diarrhea. Uh, he reports that he's married. Um, doesn't have any children, just a wife at this point. He mostly works indoors. He works in the trades. And uh, he does report that he drinks a large amount of palm date liquor. He's kind of a little concerned that maybe this is related to his pain. Um, he is previously healthy, no prior surgeries, doesn't, doesn't report that he's allergic to any medicines, uh, doesn't report any significant family um, medical issues. He doesn't take any uh, medications. Um, his occupation, I mentioned he's in the trades, is actually he's a trained electrician. Uh, he lives with his wife, no kids. His uh, He reports his only toxic habit is this palm wine ingestion, and he says he likes to drink quite a bit of that. <laughs> doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't travel. It's just in this local area, he said, with his family. Occasionally, he'll eat over at his sister's, but um, doesn't report, you know, too much eating out on the street. But he says, you know, occasionally he will. Uh, you know, dogs, cows, chickens. He says everybody's exposed to those. He doesn't think there's anything special. Right. And on exam, uh, the couple things I'll say are remarkable. So going down, um, his bottom, the right lung base, there's decreased breath sounds in the right lung base. And on his belly exam, in the upper right area of the belly, you can actually feel the liver coming down uh, four centimeters below the costal margin. And then he has something that I will describe as he has an area of intercostal tenderness. Um, his white count is a little bit elevated at 13 
Um, he's got a left shift with um, increased 95% neutrophils, and he's eosinopenic. His trans Aminases are normal, but his ALKFOS is increased at 153. Um, we do a chest X-ray. I'm going to give you a chest X-ray. The chest X-ray shows um, an effusion in the right base, but no airspace um, consolidation is obvious on this. And he has an ultrasound. Do you guys want the ultrasound of the liver? Do you want to know Absolutely. if there's anything there? Lay it on so us. they do an ultrasound, and um, we see a fluid filled it appears on ultrasound to to be a fluid filled single lesion um it's about eight by five by seven and i will tell centimeters you centimeters or inches or millimeters <laughs> son, <laughs> always son, feet. always feet yeah, several feet <laughs> feet uh, we we do some blood testing we do some stool testing right and we do an aspiration of the lesion you did wow Oh yeah, do we actually lesion? So we'll talk later. We'll talk later. Why did we aspirate? Right? Yeah. I see Dixon over there. Go. Well, why did you do an aspirate in that thing? So, so we'll, we'll to, talk about. You you have told us, Daniel, that in some cases you shouldn't do that. We should wait for exactly. some tests to come back first to, yeah. before doing the aspirate. But maybe they did. Yeah, maybe they did. Did you aspirate before or after the test came back? We'll we'll answer that next. <laughs> <week>. Okay, <laughs> but I will tell you there will be aspirate. <laughs> There'll be aspirate for everybody. <laughs> Take two and see me in the morning. <laughs> uh, that's a very right. interesting case, Dixon. You do you have it? Well, I think a light bulb went on on over my head when I heard a certain this um, palm date liquor. Is that a red herring? Yeah, I okay. think it is. So what? Are there, are there dirt floors in the house, uh, Daniel? Yes, yes. And and there are animals running around in the house or outside. He has contact with them. That doesn't matter, Dixon. That's another He's, repairing. He says there's animals. So, and I shouldn't ask about his ask about his sexual habits. That's not going to no, mean anything. No, it, but right? it's clear that the sanitary conditions are poor. Poor sanitation. That's. I think you could just say that. Do you think he eats the dogs who die and their sheep or something? And then <laughs> probably a vegetarian. Oh, that's right. Is he a vegetarian? He actually is a vegetarian. Right. And what part of India did we say? South. We're in, in southern. How far southern south? Uh, Tamil Nadu district. Yeah, I know exactly where that is. So pretty pretty far south. Yeah, near Kambatur. Hmm. We are, we'll say we're east of, you know, when you call for your IT help, you're, we're a little bit southeast of where you <laughs> of Bangalore. Exactly. Well, yes. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Okay. Or Madras. Madras is the other place. West, in, west of west of Chennai. That's a Chennai. Modern, modern Dixon, Chennai. Chennai. Dixon, do we need to learn about uh, insect vectors or anything? We need uh, not about? in my view, but in yours, you might want to ask some questions about that. Are there insects? Did he talk about being bitten? What is the rainy season? And in the rainy season, there <laughs> no. are lots of there's lots of mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. Uh, yeah. Usually, people stay indoors during that time, right? You know, it's funny because indoors in this part of the world, there's not just like screens. So the, the distinction between indoors and right. outdoors is yeah. not the same distinction that people might think about. Right, right, right. Here. right. Uh, you said his wife is fine, right? No issues? Uh, his wife is fine. No. Kids? No kids. No kids, no kids yet. No kids. No kids. Yet. No kids. All right. And uh, does he have electricity in his home? Uh, he does. He does. Okay. Pain in the upper right quadrant, you said. Pain, upper right quadrant, and a, a, a lesion. Yes, sir. Fluid-filled lesion. Yeah, we had which which extends from the lung. Stuff. <laughs> you see one in the lung, and you see another no, no, so no, there's no, no. nothing. So there's nothing in the lung. Effusion, there is, there's a fusion. So there's fluid around the lung, and there's a got it. Okay, fine. cyst in uh, the. Oh, we, we're we're good. Yeah, we're I good. think we've got. We're Dixon good. Hopefully, we got Dixon has. This is an easy one, Dixon. All right. Well, straightforward. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's all right. That's it, TWIP159. You got a title for us? Oh. How about Loa and Loa and Loa? And Loa. <laughs> or a Could you have Loa in but Upper Volta? <laughs> Could you have Loa in Upper Volta? We could say Loa and Loa, but not gone, right? <laughs> That's right. Good. That's a good title. TWIP159. TWIP can be found at microbe.tv slash TWIP. And I'm sure most of you listen on your phone and some of you on a tablet. And very few of you on an actual computer. And you use apps to do that. And you can subscribe to TWIP in those apps. So we'd love you to do that because we can see the numbers. We don't know who it is. We would never want to know that. But um, we'd like to get higher numbers. And so subscribe so you get every episode and tell your friends. 
And maybe after they subscribe, they won't be your friends anymore <laughs> after they listen to us. They can find out what they have, though. That's what they are. <laughs> but if you really like what we do, consider doing what Chris did, become a, a sponsor. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. You can do it, Patreon. That's We have an account there. You could give us a buck a month. Or you go to PayPal and do the same thing. Some people prefer PayPal. It doesn't matter either way. It's It's all good microbe.tv slash contribute email and your case guesses twip at microbe.tv Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University Irving Medical Center and parasiteswithoutborders.com thanks Daniel uh, pleasure as always Dixon de Pommier can be found at trichinella.org the new and revised trichinella.org and don't miss the living river.org his passion thank you Dixon you're welcome this was great I'm Vincent Dracaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'm wide awake. You are, but <laughs> you thought, not for long. <laughs> you thought I would be moribund. Mm, I give you another three hours and a glass of wine, and I think you're just- I'm out of wine. I have for- not. I have oh, not at no. home. I'm out. I'm going to just go to sleep. I have some work that I have to do. Uh, Music on Trips by Ronald Jenkins, and thanks ASM for their support. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another, Another twip, twip is, is parasitic. parasitic.